But one thing that we have to make sure we do is we never go on coast mode. We have to make sure that the areas of our life that we have to invest in, we have to focus on. And so often in, in life, it's very easy to put our life on coast mode and just to let things happen. And what happens, happens. And, and you know what? I'll deal with where we are. But I've been a pastor for way too long. And I've heard this statement way too many times. I've been a Christian a long time. I just haven't grown. I just don't know. I've been a Christian for so long, but at the same time, I know I go to church, and I know Jesus loves me, and I know what I should do, but I just feel like I'm struggling. I feel like I'm hurting. I just don't feel like I know enough. And that's exactly what Peter is talking about in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. He's talking to a group of people that's saying this, Jesus has done what Jesus needed to do. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus has sealed your faith and he has sealed your salvation. And when you die, if you know Christ, you're going to heaven because it is a perfect salvation. It is a perfect work. It is excellent. It's pure. It is undefiled because it was the perfect Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. But he says this, you need to add some things to that. You have your faith, but with your faith has to do other things. Because it would be great as if we gave our life to Christ, we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and all of a sudden we go to heaven, we don't have to worry about our life. But you know what? We live in a sin filled, broken, decaying world that absolutely hated Jesus. And because you are his ambassador, they absolutely hate you. And we live in a broken world that if you proclaim the name of Jesus, you're going to heaven, but it takes guts sometimes to stand up for the cause of Jesus Christ. It is easy to come to church. It's easy to raise our hands and to worship our Lord with other Christians. But what about going to China where it's illegal to do that? Would we stand up? Would we proclaim the name of Christ? It is not enough to be saved. We have to add to our faith things in our life to give us strength, maturity, if you would, to stand up and say, you know what? I know I'm going to heaven, but I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of doing things within my life that it is a deja vu it seems like I continue to fail, I continue to get tripped up, I continue to do the same thing every time because I know I'm saved, but I have no strength, I have no maturity, I don't know enough. But here's what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-8. through 8. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, and to your faith, virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you tired of being barren? Are you tired of being unfruitful in your life, in your spiritual condition? What we must do is we have to understand that when we say we can do this, Peter's trying to tell us, guys, we need to put a focus on this. You know, in, in every area of our life, what we do not put a focus on stagnates. What we do not evaluate will stagnate. What we do not look at will soon become decaying. You look at any facility, you look at any house, you look at any church, if you do not put attention to the facilities, it will soon stagnate, it will decline, or it will even fall apart. There's no different than that within our spiritual condition. There's no different than that at work. We must put a focus on what God wants us to have, making every effort. In other words, every effort means if I know I have to do something, if I know I struggle, if I know that I can't do this on my own, we have to make every effort to say, what do I need to do? Now, these seven simple principles, they can be taken at each one at face value and work one at a time, 
Or we can say, this is what I should do. And these seven principles, I'm going to work on these seven principles. Please understand, this is not optional. As a Christian, Jesus isn't saving us to sit, sour, soak, and complain. Jesus saved us to redeem the world. The church has died if we accept the salvation but set in and say, I want to sing the songs, I want to learn the Bible, but I don't want to do anything. In the churches, what we must do is we must grow, make every effort within our life, within the church, to grow. It is not optional. It's commanded of God. We need to come alongside our faith, and we need to add some things. And I, I don't have a lot of time with these seven points, but I, I really want to hit these because I think they're very important. The first thing is moral excellence. The word virtue also means excellent. Excellence means is what Jesus has done for us. We ought to sit back and say, I want to be that final product. I want to be that vehicle, that, the, the person that is virtuous, that is used properly. When God gifted me, he has enabled me to do certain things for the body of Christ and within my life. And if I am excellent, what means is I am going to use what God has gifted me in to serve others and to serve Christ. When we say gifted, it means a godly purity, virtuous. When anything in nature fulfills its purpose, it's called virtuous or excellent. When land produces a good crop, it's called excellent because it's fulfilling its purpose. When a tool works correctly, it's excellent because it's doing what it's supposed to do. A Christian is supposed to glorify God because God's nature is within him. And if we are doing what God wants us to do, we can be pure. We can be virtuous. We can be excellent because we're doing what God wants us to do. So when we know what God calls us to do and, and we don't do it, we're not excellent. We're broken. When we know God wants us to do certain things and he's gifted us in certain things, but you got mad over somebody or something down the road and you say, I don't want to do it because somebody hurt me. Okay. And I understand we've all been hurt and church is a terrible place because sometimes hurting people hurt people and a church is full of hurting people. But we can't say that God has hurt us. We can say that God has restored us. And that we are serving the body of Christ not because of people. We're serving the body of Christ because of what Christ has done. And when we serve hurting people, hurting people bite. They hurt. But when we're excellent, when we're virtuous, I'm not serving you for you. I'm serving you for Christ. I am Christ's hands, his mouthpiece, and his feet. When I serve Christ, when I honor Christ, I am excellent, not because of my abilities. I'm excellent, I'm virtuous, because I'm fulfilling what Christ has given me to do. Whether it's in service, or whether it's in talent, or whether it's just in, the, in your abilities. Serving Christ is so important. It makes us excellent. Does it mean that we do everything perfect? Absolutely not. None of us are going to do things excellent, but we are going to be excellent because we're doing what Christ wants us to do. And to add virtue, excellence, also knowledge. The word knowledge here is not an intellectual knowledge. It's more of an application of knowledge. It means I know what to do because God has taught me what to do through my life and through our circumstances and through our life. We have the knowledge of God because of even creation. We can't deny Christ because of even the nature of Christ. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, For since this creation of the world has invisible attributes, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You can't sit under the scars at night. And see the majestic 
mountains in Colorado or the shores of California or Florida or even the Gulf Coast of Texas and not know that there's a God. When you sit and stand on the Continental Divide in Colorado and you look across that vast mountain stream, you look up there and you're by yourself in the peace of God. And as a child of God, you just have to say, He is splendid. What He can do. The majestic mountain range of Colorado. And you know what? He cares more about you than He does about a mountain range. He cares more about your life and what you do than He does about the creation. He didn't die for the mountain range. He didn't die for the shores. He died for you. The perfect Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world loves you more than anything else. David wrote in Psalm chapter 19 that the world of God is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. So that its effect is to restore the soul, make wise the simple, rejoice the heart, enlighten the eyes, endure forever, and be righteous altogether. The rightness of God. Understanding the knowledge of just understanding who God is and worshiping Him for who He is. Just what Justin asked us to do today. Let's just worship the Lord. What He has done for us. We can praise Him and we can worship Him and we have the knowledge of what he has done and who he is. And because we have his knowledge, we can just say, I know what I should do. So knowing it and doing it are two totally different things. So often we come to church and we learn the word of God. And we go to Bible study after Bible study and Bible study and learn, 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 memorize, memorize, and memorize. But it's here but it's not here. And so often, because it's not transported to your heart, we don't live the life that God has called us to do. Now, can I quote some scriptures to you? Can I tell you how to be saved? Can I tell you what to do, what the Bible says, what you should or should not do? Yeah, I can tell you what the Bible says. But knowledge of application is, it's not as important to tell you what it says, but to live what it says. Because if I am a child of God and I have knowledge, but yet I ignore the knowledge of God, what I'm saying is I know it, but it's not important to me to do it. But I'll tell you what to do, and that becomes hypocritical. And when the church becomes hypocritical, we take the knowledge in our head, but we don't put it in our life, but we expect others to live up by it. And what we have to do is we have to say, my job is to be excellent. My job is is to be virtuous. My job is to take the knowledge of the Word of God and apply it. Okay, I can do that. I, I can do what God has called me to do, and I can know the Word of God, and I can apply it in my, of my life. But this next one, put your seatbelts on, because this is the one that we don't necessarily like. It's called self-control. Ah, self-control. Yeah, self-control. This is the one of the fruit of the Spirit. This is the one of the attributes that the Holy Spirit wants to give to us. But it's tough sometimes. It's hard when somebody cuts you off or when somebody doesn't like your opinion or when somebody says something and uh, you lose your temper. It is very difficult. Emotion that goes through this just because self-control means selfless. That means if I am going to be under control, I have to put myself under God's control. And if I put myself under God's control, I am not in charge. That means God is in charge. How do I know if I am going to be self-controlled is if I understand that... It, People can say things, people can do things, but I don't have to take it personal that somebody doesn't like what I say or like what I do. If I am excellent, if I am virtuous, if I have the knowledge and I'm doing what God wants me to do and I am self-controlled, I'm selfless, 
I'm not selfish, then I can do what God wants me to do and I can be commanded by God and God will open up doors for me. But self-control, in our world, I hate using this illustration, but I use it all the time because you look at me every Sunday and you've seen this evolution of Bruce's belly. (laughs) But self-control means this. If I am really self-controlled in my eating habits, I can eat one portion and walk away. But I am not sometimes self-controlled in my eating. Just like what we do on our eating, we also do with our spirit. And sometimes we want to diet at church, but yet we don't want to fulfill it at work. And so we need to be self-controlled, allowing God to take over our life. Self-control. The fourth thing is perseverance or endurance. Perseverance. One thing when people are hurting, they're struggling, whether it's a death or it's a divorce or it's a broken time within their life, here's what the majority of the people say to me as the pastor. You ready for this? I just really doubt that God loves me. I have some doubts that God even cares for me and Sometimes I even have doubt about God himself. We, we know what's going on, but when we put on these things, when we put on the knowledge and the purity and the virtuous and the excellence and the self-control, when things take place, when trials come within our life, the thing and the person that we need to run to, Satan tells us to run from. And when we are hurting and struggling, things in this broken world happen, death happens and lies happen and circumstance take place and we get mad at God and doubt God's existence. And God is saying, I love you. I've given you peace. I'm giving you salvation. And Satan is saying to us and we're listening to the lies of Satan that God must not love you if he puts you through that. James chapter 1. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Listen to this. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. It's not 100 meter dash. This is a long race. And you will be tested in many turns. The trials will be many. And they will be difficult But count it all joy because of what? Because God trusts you. When you put these attributes into your life and God is saying, I want to mold you. I want to make you something that you are not. Let me paint a picture for you. Maybe there's areas in your life that God has looked at you supernaturally. And he's saying, I have a divine appointment for you. I have a man that is struggling with some issue within their life. I need you to take care of him. But before you can take care of him, I'm going to mold you. I'm going to train you. I'm going to equip you. I'm going to love you through this trial, through this temptation. Now, when you come out of this trial, you can count it all joy because you have endured the testing, whatever the testing is, so God can point you to a circumstance where you can be the vehicle that changes somebody's life that nobody knows about except for God and you. And when something takes place and a circumstance happens and life has been changed and you are the vehicle which God uses, count it all joy because God loved me enough to use me and change me and radically help me change somebody's life. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Romans 8, 19 tells us, the world itself long ago 
with us for redemption. But until that happens, we will have to persevere. This world, we have to persevere through this world. And then you have to add to that godliness. When you have to add through perseverance, godliness. Godliness means to live a completely life for God. Joyful about it. To, to understand a godly life means I am not my own. It, 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 sometimes we take Christianity as a form of Christianity. I can take the world's philosophy and I can put a little bit of the world's philosophy over here, but then I'm going to take a little bit of Christianity over here and I'm going to baptize them together. And when I put them together, I'm going to have my own form of religion. And God says, you cannot make a form of religion. You can't play with the world, and then you play with Christianity. And as long as I'm not as bad as everybody else, I'm okay. No, godliness means I want God to be in control of my life. I want to love him more than I love the world. Sometimes it's fanatical. Sometimes it's radical. Sometimes it hurts. But the blessing of that is this. God loves you. I, I, tonight I get to teach the high school kids, uh, or junior high and high school kids in the youth department. And, I, and I've been studying this for the last couple of weeks, and it's a really neat study. It's a, it's a guy by the name of Obed-Edom. Anybody ever heard of Obed-Edom in the Bible? Good. Obed-Edom was a man. When, when David was taking the ark of God to the temple, it went on a threshing floor. Remember that? And, and the cart began to rock, and Uzzah reached up and he touched the ark with his hand. And God was kindled, his anger, because somebody touched the ark of God. He died instantaneously. David got scared. He, he said, he's, what's going on? And he was afraid, so he said, I don't want the wrath of God on the temple. But Obed-Edom, the captain, I'll take the ark of God and it can go into my house. So they took the ark of God with all the circumstance and pomp. They took it to Obed-Edom's house and they put it in his living room, just where the TV would have been. And they plugged it in and they just watched the ark of God. Here's what the Bible says, though. God blessed Obed-Edom's home. Everything that he had, everything that he touched was blessed by God. Which means this, the kids got straight A's at school. The cows produced more milk. The wife didn't argue all the time. It was, <laughs> there was something good about it. And the Bible says for three months, three months, the ark of God was in Obed-Edom's house and everything he had was blessed by God. David heard about it. Guess what David did? He was afraid of it, but now he heard it was a blessing, so he came down to Obed-Edom's house. He took the ark out of Obed-Edom's house, and he put it in the temple. What's all that about? When we are godly, when we want the presence of God within our life, the blessings of God will be overshadowed upon our life because we desire to be godly, to put God where he needs to be. So here's where it moves into brotherly kindness. Now, we've been in church long enough, we know that not everybody's brotherly kind, right? That we are a bunch of misfits that come to the house of God, and we're saved, but not necessarily sanctified. And sometimes people can say things and do things that kind of hurt each other. And my parents would probably not say that I had brotherly kindness for my family. Because my brothers and I fought, and we yelled at each other, and we argued with each other. But guess what happens when your brother and you get in a fight, but yet somebody else picks on your brother or your sister, right? You stand up, you stand in, and if you're going to knock him down, you're going to knock me down. It depends how big they are. I may let them go ahead and knock him down. But brotherly kindness means we're going to stand for each other. We're going to love each other. We're going to care for each other. We're going to minister to each other. Brotherly kindness means empathy for each other. Which means 
If somebody is hurting and somebody is struggling and somebody is going through chaos, brotherly kindness means I don't want you to go through it by yourself. I may not be able to give everything to you, but my brotherly kindness means everything that I can, I want to give to you. I want to minister to you. I want to care for you. I want to walk with you. And he says, on top of brotherly kindness, love. The love that goes beyond the love that you have for something or that you're common with. Love exists given in spite of the differences. This is self-sacrificial love. You choose to give this love. In John chapter 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second because anybody that's been in my marriage counseling classes, you know that we talk about this verse. Let me, let me say it again. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Love is not a subject. It's not a noun. It's a verb. When a commandment I give to you, love one another, it means I don't say I love you. It means I do things to show you that I love you. And when we have, give lip service to love and not action to love, then we are saying certain things. But when we love each other, when we love God, when we love the church, you know what we're doing? We're serving. We're doing. It's action. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this you will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When we love action, not a, not a pie in the sky, oh, everything's wonderful. And no, it's love. Is I'm going to love the church. I'm going to love God because I serve God. The idea in this passage in each and every one of us is to show our love to God by loving his people. Brotherly kindness, and on top of that is love. When we get stale in our faith, when we get stale in our relationships, it's because love is not a verb, love is a noun. It's something that we do, but love is a verb, is love is action. If I love God, I have no problem coming to church. If I love God, I have no problem raising my hand, singing to God. If I love God, I have no problem working in the nursery, working in the preschool, working in the music ministry, because service is love. I'm not serving the church. I'm serving God. I just do it within the church. Hebrews chapter 11 defines faith. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. I've used this illustration, but I think this is so important. One of the biggest influences in my life was a pastor that I worked for for about five years. Uh, major influence within my life. I picked him up every morning for three years at 8.30 in the morning. We would go into his office and I would read and study and listen to tapes until 11 o'clock every morning. He would memorize his sermons. I would read, I would study for three and a half hours with him every day. He was blind. But he had a mind that was unbelievable. He could stand up and not being able to see anybody in front of him and regurgitate information that we gave him for five straight days. Brilliant man. But you know, he had to trust me. Now there's some stories I'm going to tell you that he shouldn't have trusted me, but I'm not going there. But when, when I walked out of his office, when we walked to the car, when we went to the restaurant, went to the mall, when we went to the pastor's meetings, that man was on my arm. He grabbed my arm and he never let go. And I would say, we need to slow down, move to your right, move to your left. Nobody's here. I would just walk through the whole scenario. But he trusted me. We'd walk to a curb and I'd say, stop. We have three steps. Go. And we'd walk three steps down. Every place we went, I carried a blind man on my shoulder. And he trusted me. Now, I have some stories that I'm not going to tell, but uh, there was some, he's a funny guy too, so. Um, but he had to trust me. 
Do you believe God to be your guide? Do you believe God loves you? Do you believe God wants you to fall down those steps? Do you believe God wants to embarrass you? Do you believe God wants to take care of you every step of the way? Just the way Bob Smith had to trust Bruce Thomas, we have to trust God. And in doing that, when he tells us to take three steps down, to move to the right, to take a step up, or to move over to your left, he can't understand what we see, but God sees what we don't see. God sees the circumstances, he sees the troubles, and he sees the pains in front of us. And we have to trust him. And when we trust him, he takes care of us. So to do this, to faith, we supply moral excellence. Because we believe God, we move forward to do what he wants us to do to glorify him. As we do that, we gain knowledge of God. When we turn, it strengthens our trust to him in striving for his glory. These lead to self-control because of moral excellence is the opposite of selfishness. And self-control turns to moral excellence and walking in the knowledge of God. To these, add perseverance, which arises through faith, excellence, knowledge of God, and self-control. In the, in the turn, strengthens each of them to apply to the hardships of the life that we have. All these things produces character of godliness, which in turn also builds each other up to the qualities of Christ. All these things will produce interpersonal relationships which mark by brotherly kindness, which means in turn, I love God. I love God. See, because God has done everything he needs to do. God loved you and he saved you. He's just asking you, if you're my child, if you truly love me, don't get stagnated. Don't play the game of church. Don't just exist. I sacrifice for you. I need you to put on these seven qualities. And the final quality that you'll have on, it's the top of the pinnacle, if you would, is love. You will know my disciples because they have love one for another. Love is not saying I love you. Love is doing love. Love is action. Love is serving. We love God because we serve him. Because he loves you and he loves me.